Hi, I'm Michelle Malik and you're watching In The Special. Now, from the way a parent's mood is while dealing with their baby, to how a bond of support is created which helps a teenager transition into adulthood. There is no doubt that child-parent relation has a great impact on the nurturing and growth of an individual. But in increasingly complex and confusing times, where conflicting research about parenting techniques comes out every other day, when social challenges change rapidly, how can parents cope? And how can they understand the power of their actions? We take a closer look at their story. Joining us for this session today is Tuba Fatma, who's a psychotherapist working with uh, children who have trauma and young adults who suffer from this. She's joining us from Lahore. We're also joined by Melissa Hoganboom, who's a journalist and a filmmaker. She's joining us from London. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to this show. Tuba, I'd like to begin with you. Now, before we start talking about how parents can deal with the various stages in a child's life, I'd like to begin with talking about when can a child start to understand, start to feel a parent's moods, uh, understand their language, their body language? When do they become sensitive to all of this? Um, so in a way, children are sensitive to what is happening around them even before they're born, right? There is research that shows that um, um, they will respond to things that are happening in their environment and, and also respond to, you know, things like um, sounds around them even before they're born. But I think um, emotions are perhaps, you know, the first uh, sense that's actually built into us. A, a lot of other things like how to speak and how to talk, how to walk, how to actually use words to say what we're feeling are um, skills that we learn, you know, about, let's say, one, two years into our life. Um, so literally from, you know, the first hour of being born, just that first interaction um, with the mom, especially, but well, well, with all, you know, with every um, adult figure who's um, who they live with, uh, who they share space with, um, children are receiving how people around them are feeling. So, yeah, I would say that that process starts very, very young. Right. And Melissa, as Tuba was lighting that children are very receptive from very early on uh, in their lives. And they know uh, how their parents are treating them and everything. Now, in all of this, I do want to focus on language and talk a little about how uh, a nonverbal communication, the role that that has to play, even when a, ch a child doesn't understand the words that are coming out, can they actually understand uh, what the uh, body language is like? Well, absolutely. The word language doesn't just talk about um, the words we say. So language encompasses our gestures, our mood, um, how, how our face portrays our feeling. That is all tied to the language. If you think about the fact that when we speak, even before we speak, processes in our brain um, tied to the language areas are active. And so when you talk about nonverbal, nonverbal and verbal are tied together so intrinsically that when you're talking to your child verbally, um, they pick up on the cues, the way you're speaking to them, they understand your emotions. And so when you're also nonverbal, so when you're smiling and cooing at them, they understand that that's a positive thing. And when you then speak to them, the areas in their brain that are active are the same as the areas in the brain that are active when you're speaking yourself. And this only happens when you're having a, a give and take sort of conversation. So it's not enough to simply just talk at your child, mm -hmm. you have to talk to your child. So imagine you're having a conversation about the weather. You mm -hmm. give your child some time to respond, even if they are completely nonverbal, because evidence now shows they are taking it in. And the more you have these give and take type conversations, the better benefits it has on their brain going forward. Right. And Melissa, not just about babies now. It's also about, uh, I'd like to point out a parenting technique as well, authoritarian parenting techniques that we often talk about in which the parent uh, assumes this role, which is just uh, uh, telling the kid to do something, not really being interactive with them. In all of this, how do you think that adversely impacts the child? Children are just as 
emotion emotion bound as we are so if you're just talking to a child and barking instructions at them you're not giving them their sense of individuality you're not respecting their feelings um of course if a child misbehaves you have to set the boundaries and you have to tell them why you're doing something but it really helps to explain to the child what you're doing and why so they understand so it's um a give and take so even even if it's something that you want to get your child to do you might say um i understand you don't want to go outside or you don't want to wear your jacket but it's cold today so we need to um, so rather than shouting at your child that they must which might um, cause another tantrum um, just telling your child why you're doing what you're doing I'm not saying this will stop a tantrum but it, uh, as as they get older they'll understand why you're reasoning and when right why you're reasoning to them with this way and they'll hopefully um, understand that they're being treated as an individual and respond accordingly right Tuba, something that Melissa talked about here, which was interesting, and she used the word respect here. And that's something I want to point out, something that often isn't talked enough about. That's a word often not used in the child-parent uh, language, that a parent must respect their child. But you deal with trauma and depression amongst teenagers. How much of an issue is that when there isn't enough respect between the child and the parent, and that manifests into problems? Um, I think that the word respect in, in my experience working with kids um, and working with like families here is that the word respect shows up a lot, but unfortunately it shows up as a very one way um, thing, which is that respect is something that parents would expect from children, but um, we often forget that children are also full human beings um, and need to be treated as such. Um, I think, so when, when children are very young, you know, when we come into the world, we don't really know what to do with ourselves. Like we're hungry or we're cold or we're hot. We don't know how to take care of ourselves. Um, so we'll just like, we'll wail, we'll shout, we'll cry. Um, and some adult figure will come in, will step in and, and take care of our needs, will meet our needs. Right. And, um, through that sort of back and forth, we learn that, all right, like the world is a safe place. Someone's going to take care of me. And we also learn how to manage our own emotions. Um, so if we're, if, if we grow up in an environment where um, our needs are not being met and not just our, so, you know, like if you're, if a child is, is um, sort of really, if they're really hungry or if they want something um, and instead of responding to their needs in, as you said, like a, a respectful way, um, you talk at them or you don't, or you um, like don't give them any sort of proper feedback or you don't um, engage with them. Um, they also won't be able to learn how to deal with their own emotions because you know, they, they learn, um, by watching people right. in there and, uh, and, 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 um, so yeah, I think like just, um, respect and just being able to treat children as full human beings are, is unfortunately, um, something that we won't see in many, um, you know, in, in many children's experiences, I think this is something that shows up at school a lot as well, because, uh, you right. know, kids are also, there's lots of like adult figures at school. And instead of being, um, instead of, and you Tuba, know, let's bring if, um, if, Melissa if back into this conversation and ask her about, well, you're talking about children being dealt as full human beings. And Melissa, it is true that children, just like adults, have their own personalities. No child is the same as the other one. In this sense, how do you think language, actions, and every other task needs to be changed, uh, especially if you're a parent who's dealing with multiple kids, in order to deal with that kid who has their own individual needs, own individual tantrums, own individual uh, wants? Well, there's always a fine line between catering to their needs and spoiling a child, right? So I'll give you this morning as an example. Um, my daughter wouldn't let um, us put her shoes on. So she, and we needed to get out of the house, right? Um, so of course we can sit and tell her, you need to put your shoes on. It's cold outside, it's wet. Um, she was screaming and not listening. So at some point you do have to step in. Um, as, as the adult, we understand more what our child needs. So although we respect their needs and we explain to them what 
we'd like them to do, sometimes you do have to step in and say, this is what we're doing and why. But it's important to communicate that's what you're doing, and especially after they've calmed down a bit, because if a child is tantruming, they're not going to be able to listen to what you're saying. Um, and after they've calmed down, you can say, I know you didn't like me putting your shoes on, but we needed to get out of the house. That's why I put your shoes on. Um, now we're out. And next time you can help me, um, but we don't need to scream about it. So e even though that might not change the behavior, at least you're giving them a, an opportunity to understand why you've done what you've done. Um, it's difficult when a child is screaming. I don't know if you've had, ever had a screaming child in your face. Your natural reaction is to become stressed. The scre scre screaming children literally increases stress in the brain. Um, so... <laughs> Remaining calm is easier said than done, right. um, but hopefully with time, the more you do it, the child will slowly come to understand and then become more responsive. And each child is different. It doesn't work for everyone. So each parent will have to find a way that works best for their children. But it's again, I think it all just comes down to communicating what you're doing, why you're doing it. And so the child will understand because children learn to understand long before they can speak back. So it starts at an early age. And if you start at an early age, we hope that that will then continue into when they are more verbal. From uh, your uh, experience of this morning and talking about the tantrum uh, that your daughter uh, through, this is something very common and an issue that many parents face is when their child is throwing a tantrum, how not to give them um, attention because they feel like if they do, they will just uh, exacerbate the problem. In this, how do you uh, find a line between trying to actually take the child seriously, not, as we were talking about, disrespect the child, but also not giving them too much attention so that they get carried away, as many parents would say? Right. So a, a tantrum is really a child trying to get you to do what they want. So uh, children learn very early on that when they scream, you don't like it and it might get them their way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's very easy to give in to the child because it will stop the crying. But if you do that, the child may learn that a tantrum or crying will get them the response they want. So if, if you're in the heat of the moment and you think, okay, I'll just let, let my kid um, watch TV, even though I said no, then they'll learn that what you say is not what you're actually going to do. So then it's important to just step away, um, to let them, it's okay to let your child scream for a little bit because um, ultimately they're trying to manipulate you, um, even though they might not realize it themselves. And, and so what, again, I don't, I don't think there is one way to do it, but right. I think stepping away, saying, this is what you're going to do. Are you going to come with me or not? Um, so what, what I do is I just go upstairs. Um, I say, okay, if, if you want to cry, that's fine, but we're not putting the TV on now. Um, we can play upstairs. Um, come and join me if you want. And then eventually the crying stops. So uh, on a different note, but also related to attention, and this, of course, is more related to uh, those uh, children or uh, young adults in their teenage years who often feel like they have been neglected or because their parents are too busy, they are not getting enough attention. What do you think needs to be done in that case? And what can you tell us happens when a child feels like they're deprived of that attention? Do you think that manifests itself in different types of extreme behaviors in other channels? Um, absolutely. I think... Um, anything that a person does, anything that children do is, is an attempt to communicate something to us, right? So even when, as we, we just heard, that even when a child is like screaming, um, they're actually trying to communicate something to you, that they want something. Um, for, I, I think, you know, what I have noticed and what I've heard from, from many children is that um, even though there is or there might be like sort of uh, spending time together physically, but lots of times we will actually forget to check in with ki with kids about you know how they are doing. Um, we will especially forget to check in with them about how they are feeling. Mm. Um, I think it's um, it's very tempting to offer kids um, how to solve problems. You know when they come up to you and they say like this is happening at school, it's very tempting to be like okay do this so that you can fix it. Um, but, you know, most people, kids especially, are not really looking to be fixed. They're looking to be understood. Um, so for us to just check in with them and actually ask them about, okay, well, how, how do you feel about that? What do you think? What do you think are some things that we could do? What are, things, what are some ways that we could um, maybe engage with this issue? Particularly, I think as children are becoming older, 
they are beginning to sort of experiment with being um, like full adults and um, feeling infantilized, feeling like they can't exercise their own agency is actually right. very frustrating um, and tends to alienate kids um, from their own family because if, you know, if they're constantly feeling like, well, I don't really get to say how I feel, I don't really get to do what I want to do. Mm. Um, so I think it's also, it's, it's that fine line between um, it is the parent's responsibility to make sure that they um, set reasonable um you know, lines for their kids about here's what you can do, here's what you can't do. I think that's also a really important learning exercise. Right. Um, but at the same time, to really be able to say that, all right, like my child is going to be um, who they are. They can right. feel differently. They can do different things. They can have different goals in life than I do. Um, and that's okay. I think there really is like an ask for us to make room inside ourselves to let our children be who they are. Right. Um, rather than, you know, sort of copies of the people who we want them to be. Right. And those are some very important points that you list out there for us, uh, Thuba. Uh, Melissa, going back to you and picking up on something that Thuba mentioned was spending time together, but not really checking up on your children and not really talking to to them about how they feel. It reminded me a lot about how uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about spending good quality time with your children today. And it's not about the quantity of time you spend, but in fact, the quality of time you spend. Now, how can parents make sense out of this, uh, especially uh, uh, mothers or fathers who are stay-at-home parents, they feel like they're with their kids 24-7. But how? what is the difference between quality time and quantity of time? Well, the, I think this is all tied, the issues that we as parents face, it's all tied to a lot of the pressure to be perfect parents. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you're a working mom or a stay-at-home mom, um, evidence actually shows that stay-at-home moms are more likely to burn out because they feel a pressure to be perfect parents and to spend quality time with their children the whole day. And that is not possible. If you, parenting is a full-time job, you can't be switched on and energetic and happy all the time because we are all emotional humans. We have happiness, sadness, um, that goes with parenting as well. Um, and then parents who, are work, who work a lot often feel that they don't spend enough quality time, then they feel guilt. Um, but, but actually, when you're a working mother, as I am, the time you spend with your child, if it's condensed into very small amounts of time during the week, you're more likely to increase the quality um, because you miss out on the extra time. So you have the energy, you have the, you're, you're excited to see your child. And a, 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 a psychiatrist I heard talk about this, mention it like a graph. So if you think about a graph, um, when you're at work on day hour one, you're maybe quite energetic by hour eight, your energy is dipped. You're not as enthusiastic. Um, the graph is slowly declining. As a parent, by hour one, you're very energetic. You love to see your child. You're excited to see them in the morning as long as they haven't got you up too early. Mm -hmm. But by hour 12, the graph is much further lo lower down because it's so time consuming um, to deal with every tiny aspect of looking after your child. And so it's no wonder that as a parent, you feel right. very tired at the end of the day, then you feel like you might have failed your child, but you haven't. You just have to understand that there's no right way. Um, you can't be switched on all the time. As long as you're getting some quality time, um, whether you're working or you're a stay-at-home mom, both are beneficial, and we should stop beating ourselves up about being perfect parents. Right, and that is a valuable lesson uh, for our viewers as well, that there are standards that are set and sometimes those standards can be achieved because at the end of the day, you're reeling, uh, dealing with real humans, with real emotions. Uh, thank you so much, for, uh, Melissa Hoganboom, for joining us and Tuba Fatma for joining us. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we're going to continue our discussion. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show as we talk about how parents can cope in a changing world. Joining us for this discussion is Mr. Dean Russell, who's the author of several children's books, and also Ms. Dora Miranova, who's the professor of sustainability at Curtin University, joining us from Perth. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to this show. Uh, now, Mr. Dean Russell, I'd like to begin with you. 
as we're talking about, this world is much different than, let's even say, 10 years ago. It's changing rapidly. And even a year or later, we see some new development that completely changes the social landscape, whether it's technology or a new innovation. In all of this, do parents have a real anxiety when raising their kids? I think they um, increasingly do. Um, I think the role of uh, social media and what we're seeing around the world in terms of the pressure of the perfect way to be the perfect parents, bring up the perfect kids, puts a lot of pressure on people because, you know, as a parent, you don't get a handbook, you know, you don't get uh, uh, lessons or go to university to be a parent. So everyone's trying to find their own way of doing it. And I think we're in a world now where there's increasing guidance for it, there's increasing uh, pressure on it and increasing judgment as well. Um, whereas in reality, I think, you know, every parent or pretty much every parent, you know, tries their, their very best to do their best by their kids. And um, you're always worried about doing the wrong thing. You know, you, you don't know what the repercussions are in 10 years time of, of doing the wrong thing when they're tiny. So I think the main thing really is for parents is to give them time and, uh, and spend time with their kids uh, with its quality time. And I think the pressures of the modern working environment, mobile technologies, what we call flexible working, but you know, often it's more flexible to work more rather than to uh, spend time with your kids, uh, makes it much harder nowadays, I think, for a lot of children and a lot of parents. Right. And that's where I uh, want to jump to Miss uh, Marinova and talk to her about this, that the social setup, the economic setup we have, do you think it's compatible? Do you think it's sustainable for family structures, at least the ones that we had before? We do hear more and more uh, stories coming about how parents are forced to take their children uh, to work, and many are applauded for it, but many are also criticized for it. It shows a problem within society, but it also shows that there is no other option. Um, it's, it's a very interesting point that you're making there. Uh, many companies these days provide facilities that allow parents to leave their children nearby, be it childcare centers or be it nannies or, or just uh, spending time with the children uh, at work. Uh, my concern, yes, of course, this is a good initiative and that allows uh, parents to be productive and at the same time not worry that much about children. But my concern concern from a sustainability point of view is that children are spending less and less time in nature. Uh, and it's essential that we actually create uh, this bondage and these um, links with the real world, because the world inside the built environment is a world that we have created. And that world is very different from spending time uh, in forests or spending time on the beach. Uh, so it is, it is extremely important as a parent that you actually expose children not only to the built environment and the artificial work places, uh, human created workplaces, but also to the wonders of nature. Um, and a lot of uh, parents are trying to protect their children, uh, being afraid of some kind of risk if they are outside in nature. Well, in fact, that disconnect with nature may be causing later problems uh, in relation to the mental health, in relation to the way children feel about themselves. And Ms. the Mr. Nova, could you help us uh, go through that? Give us some examples of how that might impact their mental health uh, later on in life. Um, we know that children are spending more and more time socializing on the, uh, on the web with other children, but they don't actually understand where the food comes from. Uh, I can give you uh, one of the funny examples from Australia. Children think that brown cars give chocolate milk and white cars give you the normal milk because they have never been exposed to what this means to look after livestock. Or, or alternatively, children have no understanding understanding how fast trees grow, uh, what, what, what it is to have a right. native forest, what is the value of native forest as a habitat for other species rather than human species. So it is extremely important that children understand the world and also children feel responsible about the changes that we are inflicting as human population on right. other populations. Renova, with that. Stay with me there. I want to come back to that point later on. Uh, talk about the values that need to be imparted upon children in this changing environment 
environment. But I want to go back to uh, Mr. Russell and talk to him about the point you made about uh, raising children in this artificial uh, environment. Uh, Mr. Dean Russell, there's often a lot of backlash children get, those belonging to general, uh, Generation Z, even the millennials, and especially those that are uh, complete toddlers now, that they all have an iPhone in their hand, they're all using the computer, and that's, of course, uh, impacting the way they communicate and what they do. But do you actually think that there is a way to move past this now, given our social setups? Absolutely. I mean, the reality is, you know, I think there's fads, there's trends, you know, the internet and social media and so on aren't going to go away. But I think children, you know, every generation worries about what the next generation is. I think there's even a quote, I might be wrong on this, by Plato or or one of the old philosophers about, you know, the next generation being lazy and uh, not caring. And uh, and it, it goes through every, every cycle uh, of every parent, every grandparent looking at the next generation. I think the reality is, you know, these things will balance out. I think there's a lot of fear and scaremongering as well. Uh, no offense to your previous uh, uh, interviewee, because I, I, I totally get what she's saying around, you know, making sure kids get outside into the environment. And that's, I absolutely 100 percent agree on that. But I think when you're seeing things like the extinction um, uh, riots that are going around or, or rather the, uh, the the strikes that are happening around the world and taking kids out of school, I think that's worrying because I think there's a real fear now for kids around their future, this idea that the planet's going to die in the next five, 10 years. And there absolutely is a, a need to look after uh, the planet. And I have no, um, I'm not a denier of climate change, but I think there's a lot of um, stuff out there now that's really scaring kids. And I think that puts an extra pressure on them and how their parents um, uh, worry about them as well, rightly or wrongly. Uh, and I think that the challenge there is making sure that kids are informed in the right way around what's happening around the world and in the right way around the planet. And that's and my right question. And that's my question here to you. Now, a parents raising kids in this generation would have quite a, a difficulty given the generation, a generational gap. The issues that the kids are facing these days are quite different than any generation has faced. So when we're talking about adults informing children, how can that realistically be done? Because do adults even understand the uh, problems facing children these days? I think I think it's uh, I think there's always been that challenge, but I think it's on a much bigger scale now. You know, when I was a kid, the thing that I knew that my parents didn't probably was how to use the uh, the video recorder. <laughs> you know, nowadays it's it's the iPad and the TV and everything's all interconnected. And I think how we manage their access to news and access to stories is really important. You know, I think there's an element of I genuinely believe children should be allowed to be children and, and you know, give them that innocence and, and give them an environment that's safe to grow up in. I mean, when I was, uh, when my daughter was very much younger, I, the reason why I wrote four children's books, even though I'm actually, I work in business, I'm not a, a children's book author by trade by any means. But the mm -hmm. reason why I wrote those is because I wanted to spend time with her, create stories, and I very much co-wrote them with her uh, because we were spending time together and doing something that was a bit silly and a bit fun and, you know, thankfully right. they got uh, published. But I think the challenge there is, you know, getting that time with them. And if I may, just very, very quickly on that as well, I was having a very good chat with a really dear friend of mine who sent me a video last night of his daughter reading one of my books. And, and one of the, the really beautiful moments of it was the fact that actually it wasn't so much the book, which was great, but it was the fact that he was able to use that as a way to spend time with his daughter and chat because right. he's, he's a wonderful father. And I think, you know, we need to make sure we make time in the day for that and not spend all our time worrying about what may be. Uh, let's let's spend more time focusing on the present with our kids. Right. Uh, Ms. Maranova, go back to the point that we were talking about, which was in this changing environment, uh, and I do literally mean uh, the environment we were just talking about, with climate change, we do see uh, children becoming more active. Whether you see that as a good thing or as Mr. Uh, Russell sees that as a worry, something that's a different debate altogether. But in this, how do you think children should be informed of the uh, stuff happening around them? I mean, you don't want to create hysteria, as Mr. Russell said, but you also want to prepare them for the world that is uh, that you're leaving them with. 
Um, it, it's a very important point that, that you're making there because children should always be children and they should be able to live their childhood without without fear, without being concerned about, about tomorrow. Um, when I was referring about children spending more time in nature, it's really important that they do this uh, together with their, with their parents. The, the scale of the problems that we are facing with climate change are beyond uh, probably the understanding of the parents as well as the understanding of children. And we should not put all the responsibility to future generation. But there are many positive things that we can do. For example, you can go and plant trees. This is such an enjoyable activity. So as a parent, you have to encourage things that are very positive and things that give hope and things that at the same time provide solutions. Uh, I can give my own example. Uh, I have two beautiful grandsons. We've, in the last year, we've, plant, we've planted 200 trees together. Uh, and this year, uh, actually, my grandson said, let's go to the first uh, trees and say happy birthday to them because they've been on this planet for one year. So it's really important to give the message of hope and show that there are things Things that we can do together as a family, that we right. can do together as, a, as humanity and create hope, but at the same time get their hands and, and their feet dirty and show that this is a real world that is beautiful and there are a lot of things that can be positive and we can make a change. Right. Thank you so much, Dora Marinova, for joining us and talking to us from Perth. Uh, Mr. Russell, going back to you and talking a little more about now the challenges that parents are facing. Now, uh, protecting their children and especially those children who are just um, exploring technology, and I don't mean watching uh, cartoons on YouTube, but starting to use social media, starting to use other internet sites, how can parents take control of this? How can parents educate themselves and also help their children uh, keep them safe? There's a lot of cyberbullying that happens. There are a lot of predators. On that front, what do you think parents need to do? I think there's uh, two or three points really there. First of all, going back to, your, uh, to Dora's points just now, I totally, totally agree. I mean, I think spending time with your kids, going out into nature, switching off from uh, technology, having just small conversations are really, really important. I think when kids tell you um, uh, little things as they're growing up, they'll tell you the bigger things as they get older as well. And I think that's where the bullying, you know, cyber bullying and so on uh, can be countered because actually you want your kids to be able to have open conversations with you. And if they feel that they're isolated from their friends or from even you as a parent, not necessarily because they have a bad relationship, but perhaps they're worried about worrying you, you know, or perhaps they're thinking yeah. they will be embarrassed by, by uh, telling their parents about these things. So I think there's a lot there about conversation. There's a lot there about dialogue uh, around what's happening in the world and parents informing their kids, but not scaring them about it. But also, I think there's a really important point here that children under a certain age shouldn't really be using social media. They shouldn't be having Facebook pages. They shouldn't have WhatsApp groups. And if they are, I, I personally think it's within the parents' uh, right to be able to monitor that and see what's being said. You know, there's, a, there's an important thing about privacy, but the reality is for young children, you know, they need to be guarded and managed. And just like you'd watch them if they were in a park or you'd watch them uh, if you were with them in a, in a busy, crowded area. You know, it's a similar thing when they're online. There's lots of people there that you don't know. And so I think parents shouldn't feel guilty about uh, monitoring their kids and making sure that they're having the best experience. But also, I think take as much time out from using those technologies as possible. You know, if, you, if, they're, um, if they feel that their only escape is by playing a game and not, as your uh, previous um, interviewer said, you know, going out into the garden or kicking a ball around like, like uh, we would have had as younger kids ourselves, mm -hmm. then actually there's a, a fear there that um, actually that's the world they're going to escape deeper into um, yeah. in the online world than actually escaping outside. Right. And talking about that, that there needs to be other options available to these children, especially for recreational activities. And parents need to be just as careful when these children are using the online world. But with all of this, of course, uh, there is this conversation that needs to be had with children in order to educate them. Surveillance is important, but not to the degree that you suffocate your children, especially when they're reaching an age when they can be aware of what they're doing. 
So in that sense, how important is that openness of conversation, discussing things, um, making your children aware of the threats that are out there? I think it's really important, you know, you know, and I think there's a framework around that. It's not about offloading onto them all the bad things that could happen, but just explaining to them, you know, how to use these things, you know, how to use social media if they, they're on it, you know, what the rights and wrongs are, but also informing them of, of when to say no. You know, I think there's a an element that we need to make sure that our kids understand the boundaries uh, that are out there, that understand the challenges out there, uh, but also understand the benefits. You know, I think there's, um, we, we can't control everything as parents. You know, there are such things as helicopter parents who try and watch everything. I think the, uh, the, the challenge is it can become as big an issue for parents as it is for the kids and that can rub off. So I, I'd say, you know, monitor it, be careful of it, but also have those conversations. Ask them what their day's been like. Ask them what, you know, who have they been chatting to online? Not necessarily to interrogate them, but just to find out and, and find out the good things that have happened. I mean, I ask my daughter every morning, what are you really looking forward to today? Um, and, you know, as part of that, we have small conversations. And, and within that, we'll also find out things that she might be a bit worried about or, or issues that might be happening. And I think that's the same for, for every parent. You know, treat your children uh, with respect around what they're worried about, but also make sure that you're there to, um, to guard them and, and give them the tools for life, especially in this, this modern era where um, there's so many uh, places that they can communicate or be communicated with. Right. And you mentioned uh, two interesting things here. Don't be a helicopter parent and then give your children the tools in which they can uh, work uh, throughout their lives in order to solve their own issues. In your own personal experience, how do you deal with your daughter in that way in order not to uh, be in order not to coddle her, but also give her the right advice and make sure that she's protected and safe? To be honest, we're incredibly fortunate, you know, and of course, I'm a very biased <laughs> speaker on this because, you know, everyone uh, assumes that their child is the best and I, I do have the best daughter. But, um, but within that, I think a lot of it's been over the years we've grown up and, and given her the, the choices as well. You know, we, we've very much been of the mindset as parents that, you know, saying to her, when, when would you like to switch off? Giving her um, options within that to be able to refer back to us on what's going on and yeah. what she feels would be yeah. right. And I think, you know, being too dictatorial with children, you know, it does backfire because at some point when they've then got the rights and the, you know, they've grown up and they can suddenly go, I'm free to do what I want. Um, if you leave it till then to allow them to do that, I think the risk is that they'll want to do everything. Whereas yeah. actually as they're growing up, giving them the options, giving them the choice and getting them to think about the consequences of what their actions are, not consequences in terms of being, say, told off, but consequences in, well, actually, if you do stay up too late playing that game, then you're probably going to be tired tomorrow. Getting them, and that's probably allowing them to make their own choice. That's an important point you make there. On that point, I'd also like to introduce another guest who's joined us, Ms. Vita Minyang, who's a mother joining us from Jakarta. Thank you so much, Vita, for joining us. Now, Vita, as a mother and as talking to um, um, Mr. Dean Russell, there are a number of problems, a number of dangers that parents have to worry about. In this world, in this changing world, what are some of the concerns that you feel like you have to cope with and some of the dangers you feel like you have to look out for? Uh, I think for me, um, um, the biggest danger uh, is the value that is seems to be uh, uh, thinning. Uh, what I meant by that is the value that we used to hold up during our my generation is uh, seems to be um, not as important as anymore. And uh, the, that grit character that I think the older generation tend to have uh, somehow is it's kind of like thinning, I feel that in my kids' generation. And I think that's the danger of um, of living a life without grit because uh, in the future they will in encounter all sorts of issues and without the, 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 the ability to hold on and the ability to drive, I think life could be very, very, uh, very, very complicated for, for our kids. And Vita, you feel like those values that you held on to might be eroding in your uh, children's generation, but why do you feel like uh, that's happening and at a rapid pace? 
Uh, I think the, the, the flooding of information and the, at their fingertip is um, sort of, um, there's no, uh, it's just a rush of everything. Everything is instant, everything is changing so quickly, the information is in and out of their, their head, their eyes, you know, so rapidly. And then it's, I think it's hard to maneuver that as a kid. So the value that they take in, if there's no constant reminders from parenting, I think it's, it's just too much and too overwhelming. So it's, it's hard for us to instill the values that, that we would love to instill in, in their life to be able to success as an adult. But in all of this, I'm wondering uh, for also other parents, do you consider as a parent and when you talk to other parents that in all of this, your children are developing other values, maybe values that are different than your own, but um, might just be the, uh, might not be uh, bad, but also could get them through life. Uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the value of, let's say, greeting your elders or um, just giving way to uh, the elderly or someone who needs it more. I'm talking about more of the value of living uh, as in kindness and caring, uh, uh, being uh, putting others first, you know, um, and unselfishness, the me society uh, that, that, you know, we always say, hey, don't just think about yourself. Hmm. Think about other people when you're doing this. Is it not only gain uh, a gain for you, but a gain for a society as a whole, right? I feel now because everything is so instant, it's just me, 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 what I like, what I like, you know? So those kind of values, not so much of uh, like indivisible. a family habit or a family right. value. Yeah, Got but you. more of like, you know, perseverance and in, 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 in individuality and um, like, what are you putting out there for society instead of just taking in from the society? Those kind of values that I'm talking about. Right. Mr. Russell, uh, the, and we isn't alone in this. A lot of people from different cultures feel like the uh, community that they had, the strong community ties that they have don't uh, exist. And that's because the newer generations don't value uh, holding those ties together, having, uh, they don't value having the same community output uh, at the same level. Do you also attribute to uh, attribute all of that to the culture that's emerging in which the individual is put at the top? I think I, I, I agree. I, I think the thing is, uh, you know, the nature of the world now is that we can see cultures from around the world. You know, previously, you know, without sounding too old, but, you know, when I was growing up, I knew the community that lived around me. And, and we all lived in a similar area because we all had a certain uh, wealth or lack of wealth, you know, uh, a certain uh, community in terms of where we were born and all the rest of it. And I think that's changed dramatically. I also think there's a really another really important point here, though, about parents and mobile. We're talking about children using it. But, you know, if I just use this as an example, if I, if I did this interview uh, with my phone in front of my face like this throughout, um, it would be rather rude. And yet how many parents are sat there checking their phone um, and looking at a screen only for their children not to see their parents' face? but the back of their phone. And similarly with children, you know, so often you go into coffee shops or even in meetings, you know, for business, I'll go in there and everybody's on their phone. And, and the risk there, I think, is there's a, a physical disconnect where people are in the same room, but not together. And I think there's an element there around local culture, you know, hyper-local culture, but also global culture. You know, it, it's a very weird phenomenon that it seems sometimes that it's more important to be talking to the friend that's on the other end of your mobile phone in another location than it is the person sat next to you. Right. And um, I think, you know, and one of the other challenges with that is that if you think about children going up now, they have spent probably their whole life with all of their key moments with this view of somebody's uh, uh, phone in front of their face because parents are increasingly taking photos of their kids at the key moment, their first walk, their first speech, the first time they do anything, which for the parent is this glorious moment. 
But what's the child seeing? The child's seeing a phone. Right. And so right. I must admit, must admit, I'd love to see research into the psychology of what's happening to children as they grow up. What are they associating right. doing and, well and, at? And Mr. Russell, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But as we're seeing a lot of research coming out regarding how screen time is impacting uh, children's development, their cognitive development, as you're saying, it would be interesting to see how just the presence of telephones within a room affects a child's behavior, their perception. On that point, thank you so much, Mr. Dean Russell, for joining us. And thank you, Vita and Young, for joining us. Thank you for watching Indus Special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.